The podcast you're about to hear involves true stories, which may contain graphic content that is not suitable for children. Listener's discretion is advised. This is Esoteric Oddities. I have a poll for you. Is it a stripper poll? Sure. Okay. All right. In your opinion... In my humble onion. Is it mixed match, mismatched, or mismatched? All right, I'm going to cancel out C first off. Second off, you the the second option is like the past tense of something. You said mix mix matched. I said mismatched. Mismatched. Okay, you can say mismatched. Like you mismatched. Your clothes. What what about mix match? Mix match is also a thing. So it's both? Yes. Because I commented on something today very angrily saying, it's mix match. Mix match. We've had this discussion before and I really think, what was it called? Egg corn? Because <laughs> <laughs> people, people hear acorn as egg corn. Acorn. No, it's spelled acorn. No, I know, but it's something that you hear because if you see like, people just type it out wrong. Well, thanks for clearing that up. Can I just Johnny? (laughs) Can I just tell you something that happened to me yesterday? Sure. So I come home from work. My bladder is full. My wallet is empty. What else is new? Me. And so I go pee. You know, I I take my time to pee. You know, I'm sitting down peeing like a lady, checking on my uh, my finsta. Your crops. Yeah, and my crops. You have a finsta. No, I don't have a fun oh. stuff. I'm just being relatable oh. to the children's. Oh, okay. <clears throat> so I was about to say, I'm like really appalled that you didn't share it with me. Appalled. Appalled McCartney. And <laughs> Appall called. He wants to sign back. Am I missing this reference? No, I don't know what's going on. I'm like in a really good mood, but I'm also like super delusional, so I'm not making sense. I love it. I'm here for it. Uh, I'm here for you, oh. sweaty. Thank you. So I'm sitting down, and as you may have seen upstairs, my lovely mother, who I love so much, got us poopery. I saw that. And uh, do you spray it before, right? Yeah, it's the spray before you go. So I'm just sitting there, and I'm like, hmm, I wonder what would happen if I like. I want to know what it smells like. I haven't really used it. So what do I do? I spray while I'm sitting down, and what do I do? I sprayed my balls. <gasps> Did it burn? And what is in that? spearmint essential oil that is so concentrated love sarah when i tell you i wasn't fucking joking i Did you have to soak them my balls yeah i sprinted up the stairs pants around my ankles surprised i didn't die and break my ribs again get in the shower <laughs> with my socks on and i had to like thoroughly rinse my balls <laughs> so um poopery love your product but not good on the not good on private the, areas. Not good on my private parts. Area. My peepees. Um, so just letting you guys know. I can't imagine like what that would feel like if you sprayed your vagina. I feel like somebody else has to have done that. Like if you're just sitting down on the old shitter or the new shitter and you know, you just go to spray the water without thinking, maybe I should have done this already. I know, but it's spray before you go, so I feel like a lot of people that like probably got already know that with the same issue. Yeah, but um, also no one's like six twelve like you. I also didn't even shit, and six twelve by the way would just be seven feet. Okay, hater. I'm not a hater. I'm an appreciator. Oh, that's what that is. <sighs> that is what that is. But yes, I had to get my crops. Actually, it's this game. <laughs> Hold on. I've been like really into games on my phone. I know you have a fucking alarm when you need to. 25 minutes it's going off, y'all. Well, cuz here's do it now. here's the deal. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. And I hate to, you know, like toot my own whistle, but you're kind of sitting in the same room with somebody who's really fucking important because there's this app, right? I'm not going to say the name of it. Hashtag not sponsored. Wish they would sponsor me. But it's kind of like um Farmville but with animals, right? I've been playing it for a long time. Some Farmville animals? Oh my god, you're so right. <laughs> like what (laughs) so it's similar but it's kind of like a zoo right and you go in and you know your animals make you money and shit um 
I'm like a tycoon at the shit. <laughs> Do you remember Zoo Tycoon, by the way? By the by. Do you remember? I hate when you say that. Do you remember Roller Coaster Tycoon? Of course I remember Roller Coaster Tycoon. By the by? What does that even mean? It means like, by the way, but I do it because it's annoying. So I play this game and every few like weeks they have this little wheel thing and you spin the wheel every three hours. That's why I set an alarm because if you don't do it every three hours, then you like miss your opportunity to earn points. So and then it turns into this like whole world uh, like a competition with the fucking world. And guess what, bitch? Out of everybody in the fucking world, look who's number one. Pringle Master Flex, baby. That's me. Pringle Master F. Oh my God, no, shut Pringle up. Last night, I was like, I want Pringles. Pringle Master Flex. Uh, and look how many points I have. And look at the person in second. I have 4,125 points and the person in second has 2,878. Uh, fucking try to beat me now gingerly. You won't. But it's a competition with the world, and I'm in first place right now. So that's why my alarm goes off every three hours, in case anybody was wondering. Uh, literally nobody was wondering that. What games do you have on your phone? <laughs> literally one. Subway Surfer. I never got into that. Do you remember Temple Run? When you and I first started hanging out, Temple Run had just come out, and everybody in the school, it was like it was like hepatitis. It was it like, an epidemic. It infected the whole school. Everybody was playing it all the time um that was a fun game what else do i have flappy bird i never deleted that because you remember people were like if you delete flappy bird you're never going to be able to get it back so i never deleted it it was like four years ago it was when i was with um my ex who i'm not going to say his name don't say it. the ex, the ex before that ex two exes ago uh, and then I have diner dash because I really enjoy playing games that stress me out uh, there's this game called twisty road how did we even get here stop me at any fucking time no i love you there's this game it's called twisty road it is so fucking addicting it's literally just a ball that goes down a road that you have to collect like these diamonds and shit and that's that would it stress me. that that would stress me out it's so fun do you want to play no that's a great idea for a podcast is just play games that nobody can see wait look but look how fun it is watch watch ready and this is like all you do. You like break the glass, but you can't fall off the edge. How fucking fun is that? Whoa! Whoa, <laughs> that was a playing this that game. was a literal close one. Uh, welcome to Esoteric Oddities. Fuck my asshole! God damn it! Welcome to Esoteric That's Oddities. Oh oh oh! Oh, I almost just got. Oh, oh, oh. I almost revived myself, but I didn't. Um, this is a podcast uh, where we sit here and play games and tell you how it's going. So that was um the ball game. Um, it was take, okay. Take me out. So the ball game, baby. Um, I saw that you saw it. Okay, I fucking hated that movie. First of all, those fucking kids never run away. I didn't hate it, but I just like anytime they remake a movie, especially when it it's was iconic. just like the first one was was good enough. You mm. didn't have to remake, and all the fucking technology we have now, and that's what you chose. That's the path you chose to go down. That's what, yeah, that's what we were just talking about with Jurassic World and how I didn't like Jurassic World. I didn't hate it. I can appreciate the art. However, think about this. Think about, so that's based on a book, right? And it, you know, across the board, pretty much how across. how great they did with the movie. Pretty much across the board, people really like the book. They turned it into the first movie back in, what, 80 something? Um, So think about walking into a library. How many fucking books are in the library? A lot. A lot of fucking books are in the library. Now, not all of them are good, but you're telling me y'all can't find one other book that nobody's ever read by some author who wrote two books and then decided that their career was over because it didn't take off. But that book is a piece of fucking gold. Like, you don't want to make that into a movie? Right. I feel like there's a lot of books that should be movies. I'm telling you, don't remake a movie that's been made. Like, we are in a time right now where remaking and revamping shit is... You, there's a certain nostalgia. If you think about it, like when I found out everyone's popping Zans and they don't have their own fucking thoughts. Uh, OK, well, we'll go. With that. <laughs> but you didn't like that. No, I, I'll roll with that. I feel like everyone's on drugs. True, true. Uh, which brings me to Full House. <laughs> but no, like one of the first shows, it obviously wasn't the first show, but one of the ones that comes to my mind before like this whole revamping thing happened. Oh. was uh, Girl Meets World. Because I was like, holy shit, Boy Meets World is revamping into Girl Meets World. This is going to be great because they're going to have the original Cory. They're going to have the original Topanga. I'm fucking here for it. By the way, Carrie saw Topanga crossing the street. Like IRL, like Danielle Fischel. What's good, girl? Where? In LA. When she was in LA. Anyway. 
But then you have that show, no offense, and if I ever got the opportunity to work on the set, that would be great, but I'm saying shows like that, like... The show is not good. Did you when, watch it? Yes, I watched it, but because it, it's very it's very Disney. That's how right. I felt when Fuller House was coming back. I was like, this is amazing. And I did watch the first season, but I had that. I was like, all right, I don't want to follow the kids. Like, I don't really give a fuck about them. And all the shows that are coming back are not what they used to be. Roseanne. Bitch. Roseanne, boo, you are a mess. <laughs> Please go lock yourself in a room. Don't feed yourself for 10 days. I don't give a fuck. And that's that. Thank you guys for listening. See you next time. You are a disgrace. Disgusting. I feel like we were all rooting for her. Uh, no. I feel like... Mm, no, she had her controversies before that were pretty fucked up. Um, anyway, how did we get here? I don't know. What, uh... We were talking about revamping shows because I saw it. Oh, yeah. Okay. Anyway, um, so what's our topic today? Unsolved Mysteries. <sighs> bing, 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 bing. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll get it together. One I don't day. think so. I feel like it's we either, we're either delusional and not lively enough, or we're delusional and lively and not making sense. Keep your sense. I won't change. I'm saying. Uh, shout out to our Patreon supporters. Thank y'all so much for supporting us. You're like our bra. You really keep us from sagging and dragging. I'm saying you really keep us tip top, boo. Tit top. It's another breast joke. If that went over your head. Um. <laughs> I think you're up. Yes, I am. I am up. Oh. Oh, I thought you, you were just acknowledging my consciousness. I was acknowledging your boner. I'm woke. <laughs> uh, I'm not. I, I, I thought of something really inappropriate, but I don't know if I should say it. Sarah, first off, every you're going to say it anyway. And you can't just say, I thought of something that I shouldn't say. That, I, you're such a fucking sophomore. Ew, you're a fucking freshman. Ew, Froshy, get the fuck out of here. I'm saying, you crusty frosh. <laughs> <laughs> what were you going to say? I like hot but... <laughs> <laughs> Yo. Ow. If you heard that, she just like ate shit. Well, she didn't actually eat shit. She just bumped her mouth on the mic stand. You good? It's probably going to bleed. Do you want some beer? That'll cool it down. Do you want some lip? I'm packing lip. Me too. I don't know if you've seen both. Are you talking about pussy lips? Yes, I'm talking about pussy lips and lips. I have a fat cat, okay? Ugh, fat patty. Speaking of patty, I literally have heartburn from that chicken <laughs> patty I just ate. It's fake chicken. I'm it's vegetarian. because you ate it with um, hot sauce and fucking ranch. It wasn't ranch. It was bull of cheese. It was chunky. It was bleh. Junky bleh cheese. Um, but what were you going to say that was inappropriate so we can get into these topics, which mine happens to be actually... I never got a chance to grapefruit someone. Don't Google that. And if you do Google it, make sure you're not on your work computer. With that being said... I'm sorry, girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with that being said, let's get into our unsolved mysteries. I do believe that I am up first. Um... All jokes aside, mine's pretty serious. Uh, and actually, I, I knew about this story, and I don't know why it's not a bigger deal. Because once I started, you know, researching and falling down that rabbit hole, that hole goes deep. Uh, so, this is the Burger Chef Murders. Have you heard? I'm not. So pretty much Burger Chef uh, was a bigger thing in mostly Indiana back in the 70s. And I think they were bought out in the 80s by Hardee's. But um, it was like a fast food restaurant. It was like a Burger King, but it was Burger Chef. I don't know which came first, but I... Um, I feel like I know where you're going with this. It's it's a fast food restaurant. <laughs> it's called Burger Chef. Uh, so... Let's go to Burger Chef. Can't imagine. It's Friday. November 17th, 1978, in Speedway, Indiana. It's 11 p.m., and four employees at the fast food restaurant Burger Chef are closing up. 16-year-old Daniel Davis, 16-year-old Mark Flemons, 18-year-old Ruth Ellen Shelton, and 20-year-old assistant manager Jane Freed wipe down tables. Yes, Jane, assistant manager. Yes, and clean the grill as they did any other normal night working. But this wasn't a normal night. For these four young employees, it was their last shift. 
in their last hours alive. So shortly after midnight, an off-duty employee comes by the burger chef. He had plans with a few of the workers to hang out after the shift. You know, it was a Friday night. Uh, And he noticed that the back door to the restaurant was slightly opened. Nope. So he walked inside and found that the cash register was open and nobody was in the restaurant. So he immediately phoned the police. Despite the orderly dining area, the officers found the manager's office was a mess. Two currency bags were missing, but rolls of change were left behind. Just a little over $500 had been taken. An empty roll of adhesive tape was found on the floor nearby, as well as 18-year-old Ruth Shelton's jacket. Both Ruth and Jane's purses were also left. And in a nearby room, they found the three other employees' jackets also left behind. Initially... Police thought the young employees had taken the money themselves and had a night out to party together. So, they call the store manager who arrived on scene, locked up the restaurant, and left. The following morning, the families of the missing employees called the police when their loved ones had not yet come home from work the night prior. While they were still investigating, a miscommunication, there's air quotes around that, Mm -mm. between the police and the restaurant led employees to clean the burger chef for reopening, potentially removing critical evidence at the robbery scene. See? Mm -mm. After missing persons reports were made, burger chef management decided to keep the restaurant to keep the restaurant temporarily closed after all, but it had already been too late. The restaurant had been thoroughly cleaned. Early that Saturday morning, Speedway police find assistant manager Jane Freed's white Chevy Vega abandoned on the 5500 block of West 15th Street, only a block and a half away from the Speedway Police Department. So this person gave no fucks. The driver's side door was locked, but the passenger door was not. Hamburger wrappers were found on the floor inside the car, you know, like the paper that they wrap hamburgers in and stuff. No, doesn't ring a bell. Okay. Cigarette butts were also found in the car and they were collected by police, but no forensic evidence was found. The keys were missing and so were the four Burger Chef employees. As word of the apparent kidnapping spread in the small town, a 16-year-old boy calls police to say that he had seen two suspicious men in a car outside the Burger Chef just before closing on Friday night around 10 p.m. The men sat in the parking lot in a 1975 green van. Both men in the van were white and looked to be in their 30s. The eyewitness said that the man... That one man had a beard and the other was clean shaven with light colored hair. In all reports, they're referred to as the bearded man and the fair haired man. Keep that in mind. I will refer to them as so. So the caller also, this is a 16 year old, the only eyewitness. A 16 year old boy, this caller uh, told police he had also, uh, although he had seen the two guys, he swore he heard a third person in the car arguing. The bearded man noticed the 16-year-old with his girlfriend in the Burger Chef parking lot. He called him over to the van. What the fuck would you do? Not go over to the van, I'll tell you that much. Right, I would never go over to the van, period. It was also 1978 and, oh. you know, the kids were like eight, uh, 16. Right. Uh, so the bearded man told the teenager and his girlfriend to leave the area because there had been lots of vandalism going on. Is that something that you would tell us? Somebody get out of here. There's lots of van. Like, no. Mm -hmm. So while he talked, the bearded man held a handkerchief to his mouth and kept his head low in the car. Uh, I'm assuming to, you know, hide his identity. So Sunday, November 19th, 1978. 20 miles away from the Speedway Burger Chef, two Johnson County residents were hiking through a wooded area just east of State Route 37. Do you want to take a guess what's going to happen? Surprise me. Uh, Surprise. There, they discover the four (laughs) bodies of the missing Burger Chef employees. Mm -mm -mm. The state police, as well as county officers, were called to investigate. So... Burger Chef temporarily closed their doors in honor of the murdered employees, and they offered $25,000 reward for anyone with information to step forward. In addition, an anonymous townsperson offered a $10,000 reward for any information. A nearby Steak and Shake restaurant offered an additional $1,000 reward. That's nice of them. Have you ever been to Steak and Shake? No. Uh, I think it might just be like a Midwest thing. I could totally be wrong, but the only steak... they still have them? Yeah. The only steak and shakes I had been to were in uh, Illinois. Steak and shake. 
they had really good uh, fries. So, and then later, so this was all like pretty much immediately, but a whole year later, well, almost a whole year later, the Indiana, the state of Indiana offered an additional $1,000 reward for anybody to step forward with any information. It seems like they're a little late to the game, but I don't have the details on why. So, uh, let's look more closely at each of the victims and their murders. 18-year-old Ruth Ellen Shelton was a senior at Northwest High School. She had given her two weeks notice, but worked past those two weeks as the restaurant manager was struggling to fill her position. Uh, so the manager asked her to stay a little bit longer. Wow, so she if she didn't work there, she wouldn't die. And she had been shot multiple times execution style with a thirty eight caliber firearm. Okay. 16-year-old Daniel Davis was a sophomore in high school and planned to join the Air Force. His body was found next to Ruth's, and like her, Daniel had been shot multiple times execution style with a 38 caliber firearm. 20-year-old assistant manager Jane Freed had worked at Burger Chef for multiple years, but recently transferred from the Plainfield Burger Chef to the one in Speedway only six months prior. Wow, okay. She had only been the assistant manager for less than three months. Jane had been brutally stabbed multiple times in the chest. The stab wounds were so intense that the handle of the knife had broken off and was missing. The blade was recovered in her chest during the autopsy. Oh my god. Then there was 16-year-old Mark Flemons. He was a sophomore at Speedway High. He was the youngest of seven children. He was very athletic and the only non-white victim. He suffered a blunt force head injury, possibly from running into a tree while trying to escape. He had then been beaten brutally with a chain prior to his death. But it wasn't that that caused his death. Detective uh, Detective Ken York later stated that, quote, He asphyxiated on his own blood because he fell downhill. Had he fallen any other direction, we likely would have a live witness. So, now we have a quadruple homicide and three crime scenes. The Speedway Burger Chef restaurant, Jane Freed's car, and the wooded location where the bodies were found 20 miles away in Johnson County. Okay, so the first mistake the Speedway County Police made was not taping off and closing down the Burger Chef. Can we agree? I don't understand why you wouldn't... With the four employees' coats and the two females' purses still at the scene, at the very least, it should have been treated like a robbery and a kidnapping. Instead, they assumed that they had stolen the money and went out to party. I mean, besides even the money, it's just like people are missing. Why wouldn't you? People are missing. Money is missing. The door's unlocked. Right. Their jackets are there. So many red flags. It's Indiana in November. It's cold outside. Right. And their purses. What are they going to do? Without their purse going out. Instead of contacting the employee's family members, police had told the Burger Chef manager to lock up the restaurant. Then the following morning, other Burger Chef employees cleaned up the restaurant, so any DNA, any hair, any fingerprints left at the scene were swept the fuck away. That's sketchy. Now, I also know that in the late 70s, you know, that wasn't a huge thing. Like, the forensics weren't as popping as they are now. But still, they knew that they knew that if there was a crime scene, they didn't want people there, you know? This wasn't Lizzie Borden, sweetie. So that actually made me really upset because I thought there was like a Lizzie Borden Chronicles and it was like a spinoff and I thought it was real and it wasn't. What? Oh, with Christina Ricci? Yeah, like the Chronicles part. It was like an like an extension of Lizzie Borden the movie. I thought it was real for the longest time. Oh, and it was fabricated. Yes. We started watching that together. It was it's really good. Okay, but it's fake, fake news. Exactly. Uh, when Jane's car was found, a few cigarette butts were gathered, but other than that, it was not really treated like a crime scene. Then there was the location 20 miles away where the bodies were found. Officers from the Johnson County Police Department at the scene claimed, because remember, now that it's 20 miles away, the state police are involved. Uh, so... The county officers, the county police department at the scene claimed that the state police had moved the bodies before the forensic team or the coroner had arrived. Oh, my God. They're already starting this. And then after that, 
they did not tape off the crime scene. So many officers and officials tread through the scene both on foot and in their vehicles, erasing any possible footprints like, or tire tracks. So, again, this what has I, me stressed. I know. Basically, what I said before is it's important to note that we have three different police departments working on this same case, at least at the this point that I'm talking about, this point in time. Right after it happened, we had the Speedway Police Department, the Johnson County Police Department, and the Indiana State Police Department, all of which were not treating the crime scenes properly and lacked communication between departments. So... Soon after the bodies were found, police got a tip about a man who was drunk at a bar in Greenwood, uh, bragging about his involvement with the murders. This man's name was Randy Vault. After being questioned, he denied he had anything to do with the murders, and he even passed a polygraph test. Let's remember that those are not always 100% accurate. But he did relay information regarding a local gang of guys who went around robbing fast food chains. This was their shtick. It was their thing. It was their fun thing to do on literally a Friday night in Indiana. Amazing. Great. Good job. You're doing amazing, sweetie. So based on what the 16-year-old eyewitness claimed, remember this is the only eyewitness, the 16-year-old boy who called in. Uh, the police created a composite sketch. Well, composite sketches. There were two of them. Uh, art students and professors from Purdue University also were asked by police to sculpt two uh, clay busts of what the men would look like, hoping the three-dimensional details of the men's faces would trigger someone's memory. They're fucking Okay, but disturbing. let's talk about how y'all, the police, didn't do what you were supposed to do. But we got a clay bust. I was just going to say that. But the clay bust, though. But that clay bust. We're bust-o. really trying. Yeah, girl. We got Arts and Crafts, bitch. Check it out. Arts and Crafts, PD.com. Don't go there. It might be porn. Or go there, and you're welcome. So, uh, a detective with the state police recognized the composite sketches and said they looked extremely similar to two guys he had investigated before. Both the men had a criminal history. One of the men was bearded, the other was clean shaven. Um, and the clean shaven man was referred to as, quote, shotgun man, because he often used a shotgun to rob places. Now, everywhere I looked, he was referred to as this. Um, I don't think they released his name, but uh, I could be wrong. But everywhere I looked at, they were talking about the bearded man, and then it might get a little bit confusing later. I'll address it when we get there, but there might be more than one bearded man. Amazing. Uh, But bearded man and shotgun man. Um. It's also important to note that the detective did not think Shotgun Man was the fair-haired man. Or he they were like, potentially this isn't the fair-haired man. Uh, but they think he had something to do with it or at least knew something about it. So together, the bearded man, who then we find out his name is Donald Forrester, and the Shotgun Man were facing unrelated robbery and firearms charges. So the detective offered them total immunity of their unrelated charges. Cool that they currently faced if they could pass a polygraph test admitting that neither of them had murdered any of the four Burger Chef employees. The detective had known Donald, the bearded man, for a little over five years, and for the past five years, he had always had a beard. Yet the day before the police do a lineup, Donald shaved his entire beard off. Sketchy. And in that police lineup, no positive identification was ever made. The two men refused to take the polygraph test and decided they would rather go to prison on their unrelated charges rather than take the test. Uh, Okay. Let's fast forward a little bit to the next month, December 13th, 1978. A letter is delivered to the Indianapolis Star News uh, newspaper news porter newspaper. Uh, it was printed on blue ink, and the letter came from an anonymous man naming the two men responsible for the murders of the four uh, Burger Chef employees. What did they say? What did they say? He mentioned the van that the men were driving. He even sent them a dollar bill that was stolen from the back room at the Burger Chef. And uh, according to the Indianapolis Star, this anonymous man showed up to the newsroom, not the police station. Which I think is fucking weird and fucking sketchy. So some people suspect that this could have been the third man that the 16-year-old was talking about he didn't see, but he thought that he heard three men arguing in the car. True. Um, So we had the bearded man, the fair-haired man, and possibly the third person would be the shotgun man, but we don't quite know if there was a third person. So you're saying the shotgun man went in, he's the third one. Yes, that nobody saw. Okay. Okay. Uh, But uh, but we're not positive at all. Uh, So later, the letter was lost and nobody knows where it is or what happened to it Uh, and to this day no one knows the identity of this man besides 
the people who met with him in secrecy in the newsroom. So I did find links. They didn't like rat on him. I I have no idea what they promised him. They may have. I, I really don't know, and I don't know how legal that is. That's keeping anything so from the police. That's so sketchy, right? I don't, that's obviously I really, not legal. I don't it's a big know. Ass pot. Uh, but um, I had found links to images on the story. I was I really had to do a lot of research on topics dot com, uh, as well as Reddit, and the links that I I had only found like two or three links that were two images of this letter, and all of them were either broken links, like I got a four hundred four ever ever error hello. Ever, ever. I literally just had a 404 error. <laughs> I cannot compute. I have the 404 ever. And, uh, or the images were taken down. So I have not yet seen them with my okay, very own how eyes. How can these, how can that news reporter like keep? Was that you? Yep. Okay. Information from the police. I don't know. And it also could be, I'm not saying I don't believe he it, but it could have been, no, it could have been fake news. Back in the 70s. But who knows? Who knows? So fast forward uh, to 1983. This was all happening. The murders happened in 1978. Now we're in 1983. An inmate in Indianapolis came forward and said that he was cellmates with a guy who claimed to be involved with the murders. All these claims. The man claiming responsibility had told the inmate that he was a drug enforcer and he was going to go collect a debt from one of the employees working that night. He said one of the other employees recognized him, so he had to kill all the witnesses involved. Keep that man in, keep that man in the back of your pocket because we're going to come back to him with uh with a theory uh so in 1989 a little bit a few years later a man comes forward saying he recognizes the man as a truck driver who makes deliveries from chicago to kentucky and guess what bitch he drives straight through speedway indiana 20 miles further on his truck driver route is the location where the bodies were found South of that is where the bearded man who was doing the truck driving was living during the time of this murder. And along that same route, there were two other murders. So now I'm going to branch off into these two other cases really quick. Don't get it twisted. I'm going to bring it on back. So uh, 41-year-old Vicki Heath worked an over uh, worked as an overnight desk clerk at the Super 8 Motel in Elizabethtown. And on February 21st, 1987... She was attacked inside. The lobby was wrecked and the pay- and a payphone had been ripped off the wall. Vicky's body was found behind a dumpster and she had been sexually assaulted and shot to death. Execution style. For 23 years, police in Kentucky thought Vicky's case was an isolated incident until April 2010, bitch, uh, when <laughs> DNA evidence linked Vicky's death to three other attacks in Indiana. In 1989, Mary Gill and Jeannie Gilbert were killed on the same night in the same fucking way as Vicky, um, but both of them were desk clerks at two different days in motels near Maryville, Indiana. Another hotel clerk was attacked a year later, but escaped and gave police the description of a man who fit the description of the bearded man from the Burger Chef case. Do So there was a truck driver, a bearded truck driver who had this, you know, they might be connected, but they don't quite know if they're connected. But all these things. I just ha- feel like now we're at like five potential people mm-hmm. instead of three, and none of them really have names because they don't know. Well, it's I like think he said, she I, said, and like, also I do think you know. Obviously, the detective knows the names, but in these, since they're persons of interest, uh, and I'll get to it later, why it becomes so confusing because you can't name these fucking people besides bearded man and like you know we could give them numbers, but who the fuck has time for that? So, are you ready for this? I'm ready. Years after the Burger Chef murders, two key people died. The Greenwood man from the bar, who was, you know, piping up, saying that he had something to do with it, and then he took the lie detector test, passed, and said he had he knew somebody who he might have information on. That man committed suicide. And then the bearded man, Donald Forrester, died from a heart attack. So the detective York says the deaths happened a short time after the shotgun man was released from prison and Detective York calls their deaths suspicious. Uh, 
And then there's another twist. Put on your... It's been suspicious. It was been su- suspicious since the time that the cops didn't clean, I mean, cleaned out the fucking murder scene. Yeah. Well, they didn't clean it. They just didn't mark it off. And the employees cleaned it off. Yeah. A no, red flag. Mm-hmm. So then there's another twist. Donald Forrester's son, who eventually went to prison on unrelated crimes, called the police. Detective York said, quote, he told us that prior to his father's death... His father had confided in him and said he had been involved with the Burger Chef case. Oh. Allegedly. I want to come back to this thought, but I feel like I'm going to get lost in my thoughts, so I'm just going to address it now. I'll, I think it's important to, to realize that uh, a lot of people, especially if they're in jail or, or they're, um, they've done shit that... We talked about it briefly before, but then it becomes like a trophy thing. It's just kind of like... People, false confessions could be because they're just trying to be like, yeah, I had something to do with it because they already know that they're going to be fucked and in jail. So if this man is on his deathbed, maybe he told his son that, or maybe the son made up that his dad had something to do with it. And he just wanted to be like, my dad was the murderer who did this because he was in jail. Not saying that it's true, but this is all hearsay. Literally. That's why this case is so frustrating. Uh, So... As we record this podcast, in July of 2018, two of York's suspects, the shotgun man and the fair-haired man, are alive uh, and reported reportedly living in Johnson County, where they found the bodies. So, cool. So don't go there, please. Yeah. The, uh, York says he is pretty much 100% sure that these are the two men who were there and committed these murders with the bearded they can't man. can't make them take a test? What... What? A polygraph test? Uh-huh. Don't hold up in court. Don't hold up in court. We'll never hold up in court. Ever. Because they're so, like, alleged. Because they're, like, you, <laughs> right. know, it's, you can, no, no, no. like, It's It's not them. gonna... He says he... he here. Okay, let me, let me get to it. Um, so, just a few years ago... So, how many people do we have now? There's, like, 1,700 people who could who have done this. Who say that and, they know someone who knows someone yeah, that did it. Right. And uh, just a few years ago, state police added a detective to the case and said they'll re-examine evidence to see if the DNA can be used. And now two top investigators are very interested in a video found in the Eyewitness News tape library. So the Eyewitness News filmed a shit and they have had this like in an archive somewhere from 1978 and they just a few years ago found this. Um... A man was walking, like while they were filming the news segment, a man was walking over to the burger chef in 1978, just a few days after the crime had been committed, and he was heard saying, quote, this is a quote, I'm quoting, you don't want to take my picture, end quote. After peering inside the restaurant, he leaves. So police are interested, obviously, for a couple of fucking reasons. So he had a van and there was mud near the driver's side door of his van that you can see in the fucking video. Is this guy stupid if he had anything to do with it showing up while the cameras are rolling saying, you don't want to take my picture? (laughs) Investigators think perhaps a van was used to take the victims to that wooded area in Johnson County. Well, duh. York and the Speedway police chief say the man really looks like the bearded man. They're not calling him a suspect. They're not calling him a suspect. They're calling him a person of interest. They want to know his name. They want to know where he lives. They want to know what he was doing at the Burger Chef so soon after the murder. But so far, we have not a single lead on finding who this new bearded man is. Oh, there's a new one. This man who I just mentioned who was caught on film had never been talked about before, but he looks like the bearded man. In 1978, and they're just finding it out a couple years ago. So they're trying to put pieces together and figure out how they're going to find this guy. So the knife handle was never found. The chain used to beat Mark was never found. The car keys. Straight in the lake. The car keys were never found. And not a single murderer was ever convicted. So Detective York says investigators never had enough to connect any of these suspects to the Burger Chef crime. Because y'all didn't try. Quote, because there was just no physical evidence. (sighs) It was purely circumstantial. End quote. Also, if y'all would have done your job. Also, I'm not going to throw the detective under the bus because he at the very beginning of it didn't really have much to do with the crime scenes. 
But okay. it was shoddy police work that fucking pisses me off by three different... Like, y'all don't talk to each other? Not only that, but y'all don't That's use your, your caution job. tape. Anytime I... I mean, it sounds morbid, but anytime I got to roll out my caution tape, I'd be like, ooh, bitch, let me just roll caution. it on over here. Yeah, I'd frick. make a song about it and everything. Caution, don't cross the tape. Caution, don't cross the tape. Caution, don't dip your toe in here. Caution, it's murder scene. Ve- that was spooky. I got fucking goosebumps. <laughs> uh, so here are some theories. Um, here, do you want to do you want to hit me with? Do you have a theory? If you want to think about one, if you can't think about one off the top of your tip of your penis. <sighs> All right, my theory okay. is that somehow the police had something to do with it because how do you literally just forget to fucking put caution tape up? How do you forget? Interesting, you say that. I don't know. I don't know how they would have ties with these four people being killed but i'm saying it's fucking weird second thing is it was all like he said she said like i feel like if it would have happened any other time they would have prosecuted all the people like every single one right I think that's really interesting that you brought up that the police had something to do with it because I read now I didn't talk about this before because this was a spoiler. No, it's not a spoiler. This was on a forum. Oh. But the reason it could be on a forum and not out in the public could possibly it could potentially be true. true. Okay. So here's basically what happened that the man who called in to tip off that he knew the driver who also possibly had done the connected murders where the woman from the motels all three of the women and the fourth woman was attacked he was trying to link them all together and then say that that man that suspect that he knew may have also been involved in the chef uh the burger chef murders right so in this post that was on I believe it was Reddit. It was either Reddit or two of the other sites that I was finding. Again, it's a forum, so it could be rubbish. But this person was claiming that um, relayed that information to the police. The police wanted to set them up with a detective, a detective who's separate from York. A detective um, recorded their conversation, and the guy was saying that I think they're all together, and the detective didn't want to hear anything about them being all the same. He wanted to hear what he knew about the guy at the burger chef. And basically, this is I'm all oh, this is off the top of my head of what what I read that I didn't bother bringing up because I personally don't know if I believe it or not, but right. it's worth bringing up. And that detective, like a couple days later, basically the guy who had talked to the detective had never talked to anybody else before posting on the forum. And now he was saying that some bearded man who fit the description showed up at his house and was just like, why are you opening your mouth? Why are you talking? And the, Ah! the man who had called and was tipping off police was saying that the bearded man was related to the detective. And that he was related to either the detective or someone in the police force. Don't uh, know if that's a thing, but okay, it's a but theory. but that's really weird that you're typing like, someone showed up at my door. Yeah, and he was, okay, but here's another weird thing. He was basically saying that he wanted the FBI involved. Now, nowhere in any of these accounts did I read that the FBI was involved. However, I did find... Well, it should be now because... Okay, but here, here's the weird thing. I did find a, and if I can find it and maybe I'll insert, I don't know if I will. I found a um a radio archive and on the radio one of the police officers said and this was before they this was like right after they found the bodies he said now that we have found the bodies the FBI is involved but nowhere in any article did I read that the FBI was involved and this man is saying he wanted the FBI involved for his own safety so that's a theory possible could it be rubbish? It could. It could just be someone trolling That's on the internet. That's scary. But it could be the only reason that it's on a forum and nowhere else is because it can't get anywhere else because it's someone's family member. Yeah, but... I don't know. I guess that does make sense. Yeah, it makes sense of why it would be so shady. But again, it's shady. Um, so another another thing would 
could be that it literally was just shoddy police work. It had nothing to do with the police, and it was just a robbery gone wrong. Uh, the main po- uh, the man possibly gained access through the back while someone was taking out the trash. Uh, they could have been a regular at the burger field in Plainfield and like knew the layout of the building and what time they close and where to find the money and shit. And they could have been like, okay, I'm going to go rob not the one that I usually go to, but I'm going to go rob the other one. Well, they could have <laughs> gone in there and been like, oh shit, Jane is now a manager here. Didn't know that she had been transferred she from the plain field. She recognizes he's got to take out all the witnesses. You know, he panicked. Now also remember that the fucking time frame we have is the last time that they were helping a customer in closing was 11 o'clock. When the uh, employee came in and found that the building was empty was a little bit before 12.15. So that's it, an hour and 15 minutes right. that all this shit went down and nobody knows what happened in that time frame. So, uh, on the flip side, um, maybe it was a random robber that, uh, Mark recognized and then Mark and the robber got in a scuffle. Uh, the robber beat Mark bad and he was trying to be the hero. Mark was trying to be the hero, like, and the robber beat him with, I don't know, a, some, a chain, right. uh, obviously. Um, and he had to kill the other employees because they were witnesses. And this theory is based on the autopsy report of Mark Flemons, where Detective York said the report shows, quote, some of the bruising on his head and shoulders was estimated to be an hour or two prior to his death. So oh, he was alive. Yeah, they he was alive when that happened. But also he... Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Uh, so between that one to two hours, you know, the bearded robber got everyone in Jane's car at gunpoint. He could have had the fair-haired man follow behind in the green van with potentially the third robber, the shotgun dude. Uh, he got them twenty miles away and then killed them. Um, then this is here's another theory that's interesting that I think. What I think is so interesting is the way that they were murdered. Right. You've got two of them who were killed together, execution style, real quick, one and done. You've got um, Jane, who was stabbed so hard that the blade broke off in her chest and the handle was never found. And then you've got our poor friend Mark here, who was beat with a chain. They think that he tried to run away and ran into a tree, but it's also possible that he was hit in the face with something. And then he drowned in his own blood because he was laying like head first downhill. So if you think you're laying on your back, so your stomach is up and your feet are pointed towards the top of the hill. So the blood that's flowing that you're bleeding out is going down your body and into, he was drowning in his own blood. Um, so, The theory is that it was a murder of passion, which I think is interesting to think about, considering the fact of how all of them were murdered. So maybe Jane and Mark were hooking up. Maybe Jane had a jealous ex, or Jane had a creepy friend who wanted to be with her that she was like, nah. Maybe the ex friend showed up to confront Mark while he was taking out the trash. That's how he gained entry through the back. You know, he had to kill the other witnesses, which is why Daniel and Ruth were shot real quick. And that would be why Jane was brutally stabbed from the front. So she was, she was looking in the face of whoever was killing her and why Mark was pretty much left to die alone and beaten so badly. Yikes. What do you think? I just can't get over the police thing. I know I can't either. I got one more theory for you, baby. All right. Um. So, Mark, this this is a theory. Mark had allegedly told a friend that he owed some money for drugs, and he was paranoid. Two nights after that, he was murdered. Later, Mark's older brother ended up in jail for a drug-related charge, or drug-related charges. This is a fact. He did. Uh... And then it comes out that DNA evidence proved that there was a palm print found on the outside of Jane Freed's car that was found abandoned. And the palm print belonged to Mark's older brother's friend. So that could possibly be the dude who said he was a drug enforcer when he was cell- cellmates with that dude in the 80s. Oh, remember right. when I told you to yeah. remember him? Well, why was he there? 
he was getting the money for the drugs oh, sure. from Mark. And then the handprint that was on the car could have been there. He could have been friends with... Uh, no, he could have been friends with Jane. So his handprint was on the car from a time when he was talking to Jane, you know, just chilling out, Max, I'm relaxing, I'm cool, I'm shooting some people outside of the school. And then he goes in to get the money from Mark, possibly. And then is like, oh shit, Jane's here. And then maybe they had a thing going. Maybe then everything kind of starts leaking into each other because maybe they had a thing going. Maybe Mark was hooking up with her. Maybe that's why he brutally cut. I don't know. It's a theory. There's the evidence here. There really is none, none. right? There really isn't anything that links what evidence directly to somebody being at the crime scene at that time because that palm print could have he could have not been involved at all. That palm print it could have been they were friends, right? We'll never know. No, you really won't. That just makes me feel some type of way. So that is the Burger Chef murders. My head is like all over the place. I know, and it's crazy because. You know, potentially there's seven people who know what happened that night. And not saying anything. Well, four of them are six feet under. That's true. And potentially More. another one of them is six feet under. Right. If it was Donald and he really did do it and he really confessed on his deathbed. You never know. With a matter. Right. Uh, but rest in peace to those kids because fuck, man, like. Um, I feel bad for the parents. I feel bad for the parents, too. Like, the Mark was 16. Daniel was 16. Ruth was 18. I read in some reports she was 17, but I believe he, she just turned 18. Right. Uh, and she was about to graduate high school. About to move on. She was yeah. getting in there two weeks. Um, And pretty much, like, a couple days after they were buried was Thanksgiving. So. Yikes. Had to have sucked for the families. Um. And, yeah, the oldest was 20. Jane was 20. Wow. Really, um, put a damper on that. Sorry about it. I just think it's weird. The police thing is weird. I, I It's do like too. a big red flag. I, for sure. Like, it kind of rules out everything else. Like, with Mark's brother. That's so funny you say that, because some places I was reading was just saying that literally the fact that the police did such a shitty job consistently and we still don't have anything basically Proof. makes you want to believe that they had something to do with it as far-fetched and nuts as it sounds. Right. It's just like, how do you forget that? It's just It's not, not that they didn't forget. They fucking they didn't walk into it. this restaurant and say, the kids took the money. Close up. They didn't call the parents or anything. Uh-uh. The and parents like, called them the next day. And then you found... Oh my god! It's just you knew all of her, all of their stuff was in there. If they took the money, they would have took all their shit. Exactly. Mm-mm. Egg. Exactly. No, 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 no! Don't funk with my heart. Um. So mine is on a paranormal phenomenon. Whoa! As a whole, so you love paranormal. It's crazy that you said that because I posted like the question poll thing and Janine from True Crime Girls what asked. A- um, Your computer is so loud. It sounds like it's about to blast the frick off. I think it's broken. Do you prefer covering true crime or paranormal happenings on your podcast? And I said, so I'm obsessed with all things paranormal, but from an educational standpoint, I would choose true crime only because it's less alleged. Like, you know, true crime. It's like factual. For the most part, it's factual. Unless you come to my story and the Burger Chef murders and everything is motherfucking alleged. Right. So that's why for this one, I was like, okay, I could do paranormal for this. I'm listening. I'm just fighting a tweet of the week because I didn't do that. This is um the great Amherst mystery. Boo. Ooh, I'm scared. You know it? Nope. Yes. <clears throat> so uh, the year was 1878. Um, it was the Cox family. <laughs> Cox. Living in a home that they could not escape from. Um, They suffered, you know, terrible mockery, intense paranormal activity, was witnessed by neighbors, scientists, clergymen, doctors, and investigators. Listen, I suffer from mockery too, but I'm out here. The Great Amherst Mystery began August of 1878 and lasted at least to half of 1879. So Esther Cox lived with a number of relatives in a cottage house in Amherst. Where's that? Nova also, Scotia. Also, really quick, did you know that ABBA 
as well as A-teens are Swedish. I didn't know that. Because I was listening to both ABBA and A-teens yesterday. And Jason was really handing it to me. He was really? like, he's like, how can you not hear their accents? I was like, I literally hear nothing about my childhood. Let me fucking live with my hit clips. Right. That one little one minute song. Give it to me good. So the great Amherst mystery began in August 1878. So um, Amherst is in Nova Scotia, Canada. Isn't Nova Scotia in Canada? I said Nova Scotia, Canada. Is that in Canada though? Yeah. Where is Nova Scotia? Okay. Here's Nova Scotia, Canada. Look at you. It's near New Brunswick. Don't get it fucked up with I old know Brunswick. things. So Esther Cox lived with a number of relatives in a cottage house in Amherst. The event took place when Esther was a subject to an attempted sexual assault with a gun by Bob McNeil. He was a family acquaintance that she had developed a fondness for despite the rumors that he was a poor character. She was traumatized by the assault and her behavior changed. Her sisters witnessed her cry herself to sleep and she seemed depressed, but they just assumed the emotional girl merely had falling out with Bob. Esther hadn't told them told them about the assault. Now you know the whole like rumor that like for some reason they say that it like breaks down a wall, like it makes you vulnerable. Like things that right. like right. traumatizing experiences make you vulnerable and that's how they get in. Naturally. Strange things began happening shortly after the event with Bob. Esther and her sister Jane shared a bedroom and they began to hear strange rustling noises under the bed. No, no, no. I don't no, know no, if no, I no. ever told you guys, but like this is like number one scariest thing that I've ever, 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 ever heard of. Like I cannot A rustling under your bed. No, I'm saying like paranormal in general because it's like one, you can't see it. Two, they're just really fucking aggressive. Three, there's like no way to stop it. Like there's no getting out of that. Like a murderer you could possibly kill them, but like this shit, there's no getting out of. And they don't even gotta go to jail. And there there's nothing there. Like it's just like You say in my haunted house. Thank you. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. We'll just feed it feed it energy. Don't feed it. Here's energy. a fucking uncrustable. You want to levitate my ass? I, I could love I could literally lose a couple pounds. Same. Levitating. I could lose I could lose 8. Now, if this ghost wants to live in my house, hey, this is me acknowledging you ghost. Next time I step on the scale, if you could just like levitate me a little bit, like not too too much, but like mm, like 75ish. Uh, thank you. At first, the subtle noises led them to believe it was just a mouse. But um, the events um, the events started to intensify when um, the noises would be accompanied by experiences that would prove this was no mouse. During the first several nights, Esther's body swelled up, <clears throat> causing her to feel like she would explode. Swelled? Yeah, like her whole body. Oh. Like her body on. changed from burning hot to frosty cold in a matter of seconds. Oh, no. She went into spasms and trances, and she said things that she later did not recall. The blankets and the pillows flew off the bed repeatedly, even after the family members replaced them. Also, writing appeared on the wall above Esther's bed, saying, Esther Cox, you are mine to kill. Gotta go. There were loud noises like claps of thun- thunder that appeared under the bed and later from the roof. This is all creepy fucking shit. I'm saying. But. Alleged. Yeah, I'm not discrediting it. But especially because it happened in like the 1800s. I feel like at some point the story is could be true. But then at some point along the line, it, the lines are blurred between what's real and what becomes an urban legend. Especially when people are reporting it. I know. I'm not bashing your story. I'm just saying. You are though. It's fine. I love these and I will continue if y'all don't like it. You can honestly just stick Suck your my f- ass. tongue in my asshole. I'll <laughs> shut you up real quick. <laughs> <laughs> Initially, the witnesses were Esther and her sister Jane. Um, their other sister, Olive, and her husband, Dan, Dan's brother, and Esther's brother. There were also two young children who belonged to Olive and Dan living in the house. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. Although they did, they did not want to bring any attention to themselves for fear of mockery, the events led them to call a doctor to see if he could help. Dr. Crete was amazed by the unfolding manifestations. Oh. <laughs> that Vocabulary. <wink> <laughs> 
<laughs> Google it, babe. He witnessed the writing on the wall, the loud claps, and also what appeared to be uh, responses to questions that were asked of the ghosts. That's in quotes. Can they not stay at like a Motel 8? Never. Neighborhood. <laughs> Neighborhood residents became aware that something strange was going on at Esther's home. The noises had become so loud that they could hear them up to 200 yards from the house. Dr. Crete described it as if someone was banging on the roof with a sledgehammer. The usual. Things moved in the house by themselves, flew through the air. <clears throat> Household items disappeared from one location only to reappear in the, in the other. Later, fires were started mysteriously. Um, the hauntings at times stopped only to start up again, but often they followed Esther wherever she went. She began to hear voices and see entities that tormented her in various ways. Creepy. Life had become so intolerable for the family that they set the house on fire. Uh, what? Whoa. Wow, that went from zero to 500 degrees I lied, real quick. I read that wrong. Oh, fuck. <laughs> What? I saw fire and I ran with it. Oh, uh, you really did. <laughs> <laughs> Life had become so intolerable for the family um, and fires had been set in the house that Esther <laughs> had to leave her home. They were like, bitch, get the fuck out. You're you're causing this. You're crazy. Get out. You really were just like, they set it ablaze and they left. <laughs> <laughs> she was taken by a con family that allowed her to work in their dining saloon, but the hauntings followed her. The family witnessed many amazing things in the saloon. A knife that mysteriously flew through the air and stabbed Esther. Um, oh, where? In in their dining room. I know, but where in her fucking body? Oh, dum, it doesn't dum. say. Oh. Scientists, clergymen, and other doctors investigated the hauntings. A well-known reverend visited and witnessed a bucket of cold water on the kitchen table appear to boil. A Baptist clergyman, Dr. Edwin Clay, defended Esther after investigating a drawing, after investigating and drawing the conclusion that she was not causing it herself. Or she was a witch. Dr. Clay spoke about the case at many lectures where crowds of people gathered to listen. She could have been, if you think about it. She, like, maybe she, like, didn't know she was a witch. And, like, things were happening. And when once she was sexually abused... It, like, started it, her anger. And she didn't know. Like, full-on Matilda. Yeah. Ooh, that's a good good theory. Thank you. So, um, the townspeople gathered at Esther's cottage, inside and out, trying to get a glimpse of the objects flying through the air or to hear thunderous booms or communicate with ghosts through questions and... <clears throat> it says wrappings, but... Like wrapping paper. It's so interesting and kind of fucked up how curious people are because I'm going to say it. Because they're if they're, if it really happened, they'd be scared of shit. Well, that, yes. Yes, absolutely that. But I'm also saying that if fucked up shit is happening to this girl and only this girl, everybody's like, well, I want to see it happen. Right. Because it's not you. Because you get to go home at night. You get to rest your head on a damn pillow that ain't going to fly across the motherfucking room. You don't got to worry about no fucking nice. saloon ass. You flying at you like motherfucking darts you gotta dip duck dodge dodge and dodge so esther went to saint john new brunswick where she was investigated by a group i said new brunswick earlier remember that who uh communicated with the ghost and determined that this was a number of entities that were actually haunting her interesting Uh, what are these people's credibility the the scientists Yes. It just says scientists. Like, that's all I could find. It was MD, scientists. did we go to Purdue, Yale? It was in 1878. I don't think. Yeah, huh? Absolutely Yale was around then. I'm calling the cops if they weren't. Yeah, because the Ivy League schools are old as frick. 1701, baby. Oh, okay. So I guess they could have So they were already like old as fuck then. True. Like I said, this is a legend. We both said that this, they're unsolved, so they could be. That's in New Haven, Connecticut. In June of 1878, Walter Hubble, investigator and author, spent six weeks in the home of Esther Cox to document the Amherst haunting. He claims to have been the victim of his own paranormal events that took place at Esther's house, and he went he witnessed many violent occurrences with Esther. I think it's so interesting that I've never heard of this. Later in 1879, he published his report called The Haunted House, A True Ghost Story. Creative. He was clearly an author. 
he also published Fifty he, Shades Darker. <laughs> I hate you. He included affidavits of thirteen witnesses who swore that they experienced paranormal events firsthand. So each time she came back, um, the occurrences intensified. She was working for Arthur Davison. His barn burnt down, and he accused Esther of arson, for which she spent a month in prison. No, that fucking sucks. After this, the paranormal events subsided. She um, would go on to live her life. She married twice. She had two children. She eventually moved to Massachusetts with her second husband, um, although she... Their occurrences stopped. She would forever be burned into the lives and memory of a town that would be known for the most highly publicized paranormal events of all time. Um, how old was she when all this was happening? Do you know? Like, was she kind of young? Um. Because I know sometimes a lot of the spirits like to go for, like, younger women who haven't been deflowered. I hate saying that. In fact, I'm going to edit that out. John, you know what to do. And that was The Great Amherst Mystery. Is there a movie about it? No. There has to be. There's a book. Oh. Don't you feel like somebody like... This YouTube clip. This YouTube clip. Oh, of what? Spooky. Spoopy. Ooh. So that's your unsolved mystery is whether it's true or not. Wow. Well, I'm just asking because that was the topic. I don't know. Yes, it's unsolved. So do you got a fun fact, babe? I don't, but I have a tweet of the week. Oh, hit me with the tweet of the week. That's funny because I didn't have a tweet of the week and I have a fun fact. So do you want to do one or the other? I could do a tweet. Well, I have fun. I have a tweet of the week. It's shitty, but oh well. So um, at Blaine B says, quote, um, everyone, why why you watch Netflix with subtitles? Me. Because my fat ass can't hear what's going on while I'm munching on snacks. If that's not relatable, I don't know what is. Drops mic. Where's the lie? Yo, do you know how loud it is to eat Takis? Yo, because they're so fucking hard. Like, they're already hard enough. I couldn't have a conversation with Jason until I was done. And they were so good. I was like, we're going to have to talk in about five to ten minutes. Uh, so, my fun fact is that a Neanderthal's brain was bigger than ours is now. And considering the fact that I sprayed my balls with poopery, I really don't doubt that. Ah. Uh, so my tweet of the week is, apparently this is trending. It's probably going to be, you know, by the time this comes out, it's going to be already donezo. But this is a new thing everybody's doing is like, if you remember this, then you're qualified for the veterans discount thing. Have you seen that? No. Uh, well, you're gonna. Uh, it's basically just like something that happened in your childhood or some shit like that. Or at least that's what I'm picking up on it. It says, if you remember this video, you're qualified for veterans discount. And it is a screenshot from the Harry I Potter. I love that, but I also hated it. The Harry Potter puppet pals uh, thing with the naked Dumbledore for some reason. Uh, good times. That was one of the best YouTube videos ever. Love that. Thank you guys so much for listening. Uh, if you can, please give us ratings. Yes, uh, rate us. We were definitely picking up on some ratings, especially on iTunes, and then it kind of stopped. And it really, really, really helps us immensely. Even if you just give us five stars and yeah, an, honestly, an emoji. Yeah, say, this is great. And like a smiley face or something. It helps people find us so they can listen to us and our hard work and how much uh, bullshit we like to talk to each other. and Or everyone. how much alleged stories we tell. Yeah, and it, I just want to warn the world about spraying your balls with poopery. That's all I'm trying to do. Yeah, don't, don't do that out here. And thank you for your support. Yeah, thank you for your support. Thanks to our Patreon supporters. If you guys want bonus episodes, uh, you get a couple every every month. Head on over to patreon.com slash esoteric oddities. You know where to find us on the social medias. Uh, if you want to send us an email, oddiespodcast at gmail.com. And until next time, I'm Sarah. I'm Jonathan. And we're, we're out, out of here. Of here. Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Ew.